All right, good morning, everyone. So we're gonna start the final unit today on clustering. And I just uh, made a slight rearrangement of the notes. So if you have already um, printed out or downloaded the notes, just notice that um, I'm gonna start with this clustering section before talking about the motivating example. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> So what is clustering? Basically, this is an unsupervised learning task where we're only given a data set X of feature vectors. And our goal is to partition this data set into K groups of similar samples. So for example, um, maybe you're given this data set here. And when you're given the data set, there are no colors. So you're just given all those points. And your objective is to figure out how you can partition those points into five different clusters. And after you've decided to do that, or decided how to do that, that that's when the colors come in. So you've decided that this is one cluster, this is another cluster, and so on. And so here you can see that the definition of similarity is related to the fact that these points are close together. Um, but of course, when you have points that are outliers that are, you know, close to two clusters, your exact definition of similarity will determine on whether that point, you know, how that given point is clustered. Here we have another data set. This is the so-called two moons data set where um, you can see that the clustering algorithm, this is a little bit unusual for a clustering algorithm, this one. Um, clusters into cluster zero, cluster one, and then it also um, has this noise category where it, if there's a, a sample that it can't put well in a cluster, it, I, it sort of flags that as a separate thing. But you can see that overall it did a pretty good job of clustering those points as one thing and clustering these points as another thing. Um, and, you know, then it, it a few of them that it wasn't as sure about it clustered as noise. But these are just examples of clustering in, in low dimensions uh, for numerical, numerical features. Uh, later on, we'll get into what happens when you have um, text as your data instead of numbers. We'll have to ha find a way of, of translating that text to numbers, and so we'll talk about that later. But when you look at clustering algorithms, there's definitely a lot of them. But by far, the best known algorithm for clustering is called k-means. And the idea behind k-means is you want to design um, k centroids. These are just vectors, the same dimension as the feature vectors, that minimize this RSS cost. And the cost. Um, looks quite a bit different than what we've seen so far in the course because you have the sum of the minimum of this. And notice that this minimization here is performed separately for every sample. So for every sample xi, you uh, find the minimum of those capital K clusters and then you compute the sums of the squared Euclidean distance to that point. So for example, in this picture down here, the clusters had been decided to be these pluses. And so to formulate the cost, you would take all these purple samples that are closest to this cluster, and you would, <coughs> you would measure their, their distance to there. And then, you know, for, for other samples, you would find their closest um, sorry, not cluster, their closest centroid, and you would compute the distance from those centroids and so on. So for any given sample, you first figure out what's the nearest centroid, and then you, you, um, you compute the distance to that, and then finally you add up all those distances. So again, the objective in, in doing this is to find the centroids so you're, you're moving these centroids around and trying to figure out where you can place them so that you minimize the sum squared distance from each sample to the closest centroid. So that's the goal. <clears throat> uh, 
And once you've determined your centroids, then um, clustering is just finding the K. So for, for a given XI, if you want to say which clusters that belong to, you just find the K uh, of the nearest centroid. So the one, the centroid that is closest in Euclidean distance, we can call that K hat. So that's the K hat for XI. And you can think about uh, this in terms of decision regions. So for example, for this centroid here, all the samples in this Voronoi cell are closer to this centroid than to any other centroid. All the samples over here are closer to this centroid than any other centroid, and so on. Okay, so this is, this is the idea behind k-means clustering. Is the overall objective making sense, what we're trying to do? Okay, so unfortunately this problem has no closed form solution. Um, there's really no way to solve this optimization problem. Um, yeah, there's, there's really no known exact solution to this optimization problem. However, there's a very famous algorithm that gives an approximate solution called Lloyd's algorithm. And Lloyd's algorithm basically just iterates two steps. And this is how it goes. You start with some initialization of the centroids. Then, given those centroids, we know that they determine these Voronoi cells. So what you do is for each um, of those Voronoi cells, you compute the mean of the data within that cell, call it mu k. Second step is you just set, set the, cent, the new set centroid ck as mu k. So let's look at an example. So this is where we start. This is our data set. And these are the centroids that we um, have used as our initialization. <clears throat> and so you can see that the first step is to compute the Voronoi cells. So that would be, you just make a line bisecting those two centroids. And then anything that's on this side of that line corresponds to the red centroid. Anything over here corresponds to the blue centroid. And so that's <coughs> computing the Voronoi cell. Now we compute the mean of the data within each cell. So the mean of all those blue points is here. The mean of all the red points is here. Now that we have um, those means, we just set our new centroids as you know, those means. And then we start over. So now we compute our new Voronoi cells we um, look at the mean of those points, which is here, look at the mean of all these points, which is here, and those become our new centroids. So then we, once again, new Voronoi cells. And you can see this is sort of converging. Um, at some point, you'll find it converges exactly in the sense that once um, the membership of the samples in each cell stops changing, the means stop changing, and the answer is exactly the same as the previous iteration. And at that point, you know you can stop the algorithm. So in this case, the algorithm clustered these blue points this way, these red points this way, and as you can see, did a pretty good job of clustering this data set. Um, <clears throat> now, the main issue with this algorithm is that you can get stuck in a local minimum of the cost. The cost is non-convex, so especially in a higher dimensional problem, it um, you know, doesn't work out as nicely as in this little toy example here. And really it boils down to how good your initialization is. So a common technique when you run k-means is to run it a number of times from different initializations. Maybe you run it 10 times, and you, um, you somehow pick uh, the best clustering. For example, you can evaluate this cost for all of your 10 initializations, and you can choose the one that minimizes that cost. So that's a common technique. But um, you know, it really does boil down to initialization. So there's a famous initialization method known as k-means++, 
that gives you a certain guarantee on um, how bad the initialization can be. So um, basically, that's, that's the, the main way people run this. And if you look at sklearn.cluster.kmeans, this plus plus initialization is the default one. But even that one is not perfect. And you still might want to run that a few times and then choose the lowest um, k-means cost. Okay, so that's, that's k-means algorithm, most famous clustering algorithm. Any questions? Or anything? Yes? How do we decide k? That's a great question. Um, so <coughs> there's, there's sort of a whole separate literature on, on how you choose k. So you could imagine, um, I mean, I, I think what you need is you need some sort of criteria for how you want to choose it and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I wasn't going to talk about that. Um, I think it's going to depend in part on the clustering method. So most, me most, most methods that I'm aware of, what you do is you might try several hypotheses of k and then um, based on those hypotheses, you have to have a way of, um, it's like a model or selection problem, basically. And, and the thing is, you cannot just rely on this cost, because I think this cost will just be monotonically decreasing in K, similar to what we saw with RSS back in Unit 3. So what you typically do then is you add some regularization term that penalizes uh, you know, increasing k too much, and then the form of that regularization term, well, there's a lot of different ones you can use. So um, but that's overall the, the scheme that people would use. Why is the cost not convex to this norm? Well, because you have this min. Yeah, so like I said before, this is, this is very different from what you've seen before. Because if you get rid of this min, um, I mean, it doesn't exactly make sense because then the question is, what is k? But you know, if the, the min is what makes this really interesting and really different from everything we've seen until now in the course. <clears throat> it's, it's like you're doing a separate minimization for every i and then looking at the result of that minimization and trying to choose your, your centroids that give you the best result of that minimization. So it's pretty different from anything we've seen. Yeah, all right, um, okay, so that's, I think that's all I had to say about k-means. Any other question on k-means? So we're gonna talk about other clustering methods also, but, but this is, like I said, probably the most well-known and just a really good place to start if you ever need to cluster something, see what happens with k-means. It's very straightforward, okay. So now let's move on to a particular example of clustering that's a little bit more interesting than the toy examples we saw. Let's say that we have a huge corpus of documents. A corpus is just another word for a collection of documents. And let's say we would like to organize these documents. Um, <clears throat> so how do we do that? Well, I mean, overall what we're saying is that we can cluster these documents. That's the goal. We want to group the documents into similar categories. And of course, we're going to have to do this depending on the words that are in all these documents. So um, this is one example of what they call text mining. There's many other forms of text mining, but this document clustering is definitely one. And so just you know, as, as a pictorial example, you have like a whole bunch of articles or emails or whatever. And we want to somehow organize these into a few that we call category one, a few more we call category two, and so on. Okay, so <clears throat> for our data set, we are going to use um, these news group articles from the Usenet. Um, this was an online discussion forum that uh, started on university networks in the late 70s, migrated to internet, peaked in the 1990s, and it's it's a you know, nice, uh, relatively small data set that we can use. Um, one nice thing about it is that it does have ground truth category labels. So when we do clustering and we want to see, did we, do we have a good clustering? 
we can actually compare it to some ground truth. Um, so a little bit more detail here. We're, we're going to use this 20 news groups data set. So there are 20 news groups in total. You can see they're sort of hierarchically organized into some subcategories here. But um, these are all just discussion groups that people participated in. Um, each one of these categories has about 1,000 documents in them. And you can see that there's a number of categories here that have to do with computers, software and hardware, um, recreational hobbies, uh, science topics, um, political topics, religious topics, and a for sale topic. Okay, so this is built into sklearn. Um, we're just gonna download four of the categories, um, in particular, alt.atheism, computer graphics, sci.space, talk, religion, misc. And um, when we load these, we'll find that we're going to get 3,387 um, samples in total. And we're going to remove the, some of the headers and footers. So these are things like, um, you know, like if, if you see the full content of an email uh, before the text at the top, there's all these numbers of how it got routed and so on. And so we're going to remove that stuff. And um, let's see, we're going to shuffle our data. Um, yeah, OK. So and once we download the data set, it's organized um, as follows. So this data set object has um, an array of Usenet posts and data. And these are basically represented as strings. Then it has um, an array of class labels or post categories. So in other words, every one of the, every one of the posts has a label. In other words, we know for every post we download which one of these, actually, which one of these four it came from. So that's the ground truth label that once we're done clustering, if we want to see, did we cluster this well? we can see you know, whether we actually, whether our cluster labels correspond to these news group labels. And then we also have the target names. This is just the title of each category, so that's just this list of names here. <clears throat> so let's take a look at how we can access the data. So let's say we take the um, document index 10, so it's the 11th um, sample in our data set, so we can look at dataset.data10, and if we print this out, we find that it's, um, it's basically this. So it looks like a short email, almost, and you can see it's someone that was, they had a particular um, graphics card, and they're having trouble configuring it, and, you know, they're asking some questions. Um, so then if you look at labels... 10, this extracts um, the index between 0 and 3. And then if we plug that index into data set target names, it will print out, or it will, it will tell us which of these it's coming from. Okay, so, so we have labels, we have the data itself, and then we have basically the, the different titles of the categories. Okay, so we would like to essentially, the first thing we'll do is we'll apply k-means to this data set. Um, after this, uh, maybe not today, um, maybe on Monday, we'll try some other methods. We'll see how they compare. Okay, so obviously the first thing is we, we need to figure out how to work with text. We don't, this is not, not something we've seen before in this course. So we have to represent these documents numerically, um, not as strings. <clears throat> okay. So to do this, the so-called bag of words model is the most common way of doing this. And this is how it works. You look at all the words in your data set, so all the words across all the documents. You make a big list of them. 
And these are typically referred to as terms instead of words. So you make a list of all the terms. So here's just a simple example. We have two documents. You can see each is one sentence. Um, so we make a list of all the terms here, and we just make a list like this. This becomes, you could think of it as a dictionary. But some of these terms we should take out. Terms like the, you know, very common, is, and so on. And so we have what's called a, word of, a list of stop words. <clears throat> the stop words, um, they're of course going to be language dependent, but these are words that we remove when creating our dictionary. Okay. And then finally, the way that we, that we represent these two documents is we, <clears throat> we represent them as an array of word counts. So you can see here document one, we just put an integer next to how many times the word appeared. So many of these words didn't appear in document one, so they have a zero. Um, for this you know, really small example, the most, the most that a given word appeared in any document is one, but in general, you would find numbers greater than one. Um, it's just that in this little toy example, it's zeros or ones. But in general, it's going to be some integer for document one and some list of integers for document two. Okay? So that's the idea behind the bag of words model. Any questions on that? Is that making sense? All right. So if you think about it, there's some shortcomings to this this approach, just as presented here, which is that um, some documents, <clears throat> some documents are much longer than others. So that would mean that there's going to be some sort of imbalance. Like, you know, maybe one document that's very long is going to have, um, if you sum up all these numbers, that'd be you'd have a much larger sum than another document, and so on. And then there's another issue is that some of the terms are much more common than others. So, you know, maybe some of these terms, if you, if you sum this way, would have a much longer, a larger sum than others. So we'd like to, we don't want to be, um, we don't want our algorithm to focus on the terms that are um, the most common. You know, in some sense, those are the least interesting terms, the, the terms that tell us least about how to, how to cluster. Okay, so here's a... a a very popular approach to dealing with this. These are called TF-IDF features. So first of all, <clears throat> rather than just looking at uh, counts of terms, let's look at frequencies. So we'll build this matrix TF um, indexed by i and j. And so TF-IJ is the number of occurrences of term J in document I divided by the total number of terms in document I. Right? So this is going to be um, a number between 0 and 1. And um, if you summed this across all J, it would sum up to 1. So it's kind of like a, a PMF of terms for document I, if you look at cross J. And the nice thing about this is that this is going to be, this quantity is invariant to the document size, right? I don't, once I compute this, I have no way of really telling, um, well, I'm, I'm not going to be biased by uh, a very large document. <clears throat> okay, so the second quantity here is called the inverse document frequency. So this is, uh, this is the negative log of the following ratio, the ratio of the number of documents with term J divided by the total number of documents. So this is trying to assess how common is this term. Is this a term that appears in all the documents, if so, it's probably not, not, not very useful in, in um, clustering. But if it's, you know, 
occurs in just a few documents, then okay, this, this term is probably going to be useful. Um, so by looking at the negative log, it has the effect of emphasizing the uncommon terms. Okay, so you have these two quantities, TF and IDF, and if you multiply them like this and call that product XIJ, where, where you're going to use X as your, your features. So again, I going down this way is going to be your document index. J going across this way is your term or word index. This we can use as our um, feature matrix. So we're constructing it like we've done since the beginning of the term, where the samples, in this case, documents go this way, and the features or terms, in this case, go that way. And this TF IDF approach is incredibly popular. So as of 2015, this was used by 83% of text recommender systems. So it's just like the default way that people tend to work with this information. Sometimes when you read other papers, you'll find that this X matrix is transposed from how we were presenting it, but presenting it this way just to be consistent with how we've done it for the rest of the course. Okay. So this thing is finally called the term document matrix. So we have docs this way and terms that way. Okay. So now we have a way of taking a bunch of documents and representing it as a numerical features, and it's a very standard approach, so it probably works pretty well. All right. Any questions on? Yes. What are the types of recommendations on recommendation systems? Um, I'll, I'll talk on the next page about a recommendation system. Um, I guess, um, yeah, I guess there's a question about what you're saying, what, what, what exactly do I mean by recommender systems? Yeah, I think, um, let, me give you, let me give you an example on the next page. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this. You can actually do many, many things once you have this feature matrix. So um, <clears throat> I would say it's still an unsupervised problem because we don't have any labels Y, right? So it's not like we have X and Y. So when you talk about classification, you're usually thinking, I have some features, I have some labels. It's a supervised problem. Here, we just have the features alone. So it's unsupervised. So that might be a partial answer to your question. But yeah, there's many things we can do with this. So let's think about document retrieval. Um, and this is essentially when you think about what you're doing when you go to Google, you're essentially doing document retrieval, right? Um, you type in a term, and you want to know which documents on the internet best correspond to your term. So a very simple way of doing that, if you have this term document matrix X, is you look up the index of the term you're interested in, J. So that would be the Jth column. You extract the jth column of your matrix. Now you have a vector. And if you look across that vector, you're going to find some scores that tell you how much. Um, if I look, at, let's say, at the ith element in DJ, I'll figure out how much the ith document is related to the term I'm searching for. So if I want to find the most relevant documents, I would just sort this, and I would just tell you you know, this is the most relevant document, second relevant doc, most relevant document, and so on. All right, so this is a super simple way of building a search engine. So this would be one example of a text recommender system. Um, there's many other things you can do. So semantic analysis, maybe you're trying to understand the structure of a language or terms. You want to know is this term a synonym for another term? How can I figure that out? So maybe what you could do is you could pull out the, these document vectors for two different terms, 
j and j prime, and then do an inner product to measure their similarity, something like this. Um, this is kind of saying like if these if these terms are, are always coming up in the same documents, they must be very closely related. So these are just two examples of things you can do with the term document matrix. Of course, clustering is another one that um, is sort of the, our focus in this unit. Okay, any, any more questions? All right, so let's take a closer look at the precise structure of this matrix. So the first thing to point out is that this matrix can be huge. So even in our pretty simple example, which was the, the, the news groups where we had four news groups, so I think we saw 3,300 documents and 39,000 terms in the vocabulary just from those documents. So that's just a real small toy problem, but we already have like a, you know, 3,300 by 38, 39,000 matrix to deal with. Now, it turns out that when you look at that matrix, most of the elements are zero valued, which is to say most documents are not even using most terms in the dictionary. So there's a lot of zeros. So sparse just means most elements are zero valued. And so when you represent these matrices you know, in, a, in a computer, you represent them as sparse matrices. So a sparse matrix, you know, the, 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 the matrices we're used to dealing with are dense matrices where the computer basically has a, a memory register for every element in the matrix. So if you have a n by d matrix, you have n times d pieces of memory reserved, and you just memorize you know, what is the floating point value or whatever, um, whatever data type you're using. When you have a sparse matrix, you first have a list of which are the non-zero elements in the matrix, and that list contains the indices of those, and then you store um, memory only for the non-zero values. You know, so if I have a giant matrix that has only 10 non-zero terms, then what I'm going to store is those 10 non-zero terms as well as their locations in the matrix. And okay, probably the overall size of the matrix, but that's it. So you, so you don't really have to store much at all with a sparse matrix. Of course, once you start doing things like matrix multiplies, they become a little bit more challenging than a dense matrix because you have to figure out, okay, where in this matrix multiply am I going to find the data that I need to do the multiplications? So, um, so once the matrix gets really small, or let's say really sparse, even though those multiplications and the operations you're trying to do are difficult, just because you have so few values, it's still much faster. But if you, if you have a matrix with, with, let's say, half the elements non-zero, and you try to do a matrix, sparse matrix multiply, it's actually going to be slower than a regular matrix multiply. In my experience, it's once your sparsity gets down to about 10%, that's when there's a break-even point. And if it's sparser than 10%, then matrix multiplies are actually faster with, uh, with sparse matrices. Now, for these sort of term document matrices, I think they're often much sparser than 10%. So it really makes sense. And they're, they're giant. You probably wouldn't have room to store them otherwise. And when you think about, like, Google, you know, imagine how many documents it has access to, right? Probably billions. I don't know, maybe more. And terms, of course, any term you can imagine. So... Um, <coughs> So there's real issues there. OK, so we talked about um, x, the elements of x being sparse. But that's not the only structure that we can leverage. The eigenvalues are also sparse, which is to say these matrices have low rank. So if you did a singular value or eigenvalue decomposition, low rank means a lot of 
um, sparse, a lot of zero eigenvalues, a lot of zero singular values. And this structure can be exploited for document clustering, and this is actually going to be the basis behind the second approach. Essentially, we're going to apply PCA to this problem to try to do clustering. So maybe not today, but maybe on Monday. Um, and this can also be, there's ways you can store the matrix just in terms of its um, singular values and singular vectors instead of the overall matrix. So you could actually use this for storage as well if you wanted to try to do that. And one more structure is that the matrix is non-negative. And this will give us another structure that we can use for a variant of PCA called non-negative matrix factorization, which we'll see will work a lot better than PCA um, if we, when, we, when we try to do clustering. Okay, so these are all sort of important um, properties of this term document matrix. All right, any questions on anything here? All right. Okay, so because this is a very well-known method, it's implemented um, in Python. It's very easy to, to do. So essentially, you start by instantiating this, this thing. It's called the TF-IDF vectorizer. You want to tell it which stop words. So for English language, there's a default list of stop words people use. And then all you have to do is vectorizer.fit transform on your data set. And then we can, um, we can look at the size of the matrix, and you can see we have 38, sorry, 3387 samples, those are documents, and 38777 features or terms. Once we have this matrix X numerically, we can run k-means very easily on it. But before we do that, let's just take a look at some of the um, <clears throat> the numbers in this TF-IDF matrix. So we're going to take that same document that we saw earlier, number 10, and let's um, look at the corresponding row in our TF-IDF matrix. And this is a sparse matrix, so we're going to, we have to do two dents to, to make it into a vector. And then we, we get this vector, and what we can do is we can sort it um, from, yeah, we're, we're going to sort it. And then, uh, let's see. So, OK, so the arg sort gives us the, um, the indices from sorting. And then we can plug them in here into this and, and, and print out the actual um, the actual values in this in this row sorted, and we essentially get this. So here we're showing the term and the value in the TF-IDF matrix sorted. So you can see that after a certain point, it's all zeros. So the non-zero ones are up here, and you can see like the the term that seems to be the most important term in this document, according to the TF-IDF scores, is POV, and then hello, and boxcar, and so on. So according to the way the TF-IDF scores are, are created, you know, it thinks that these are the words that are most special about, you know, what makes this, this document unique, essentially, would be these words and in this order. OK, so now that we've seen an example, let's run k-means. So we can use sklearn.cluster.k-means. And it's very easy to, to run. So here we, we have to tell it how many clusters we want. So you know, we're, we, we're going to use four um, just to be for simplicity. For initialization, we're going to use k-means++. Plus plus. We're going to use 100 iterations maximum, although it may stop before that. Um, number of initializ initializations, we'll just use one, although I said in, in practice you might want to do this several times and then 
choose the one which gave you the lowest k-means cost. So once we instantiate it, we just do k-means fit on our TF-IDF matrix. And you can see it's printing out um, with the iteration. I think inertia is probably the cost. I'm not positive. But it got to the point where um, I believe that this was the, the eventually, yeah. So there's a some sort of tolerance parameter that once the difference probably between two consecutive ones is smaller than the threshold, it stops. Yeah, so here's the tolerance. And um, <clears throat> let's see what happens, what, or what happened with k-means. So we asked it to compute four centroids. Each centroid, in this case, is a 38777 length vector of TF-IDF scores, right? The centroids have... Um, The centroids have the same size as each of our features, x, j, or I guess each, each column in our, in our x matrix. And every column, wait, am I saying that right? Um, sorry. So, so this, is our, this is our matrix. And we can think of x, j, this is our x matrix, x, j, transpose would be like a row. This is 38777. And the dimension of xj and the dimension of our clusters are the same. So that's why this is a 3877-like vector for the centroids. <clears throat> OK, so um, and let's see. So once we get this. Um, the vector, we can do something similar to what we did back here. We can, we can sort it, and we can find for that centroid what were the terms that are most important. And then we can, you know, we can't plot all 38, 39,000 of them, but we can plot the first few. And that's what we're plotting here. Top 10 scores of every century, top 10 words. So in cluster zero, you can see these are the, the, the top terms. And you can see that they, they seem to have a lot to do with um, religion. So it could be coming from alt-atheism or talk religion misc. The next one, when we look at these, um, it's hard to know. But uh, you know, it doesn't seem like it has to do with graphics or space. Now, the next one definitely does seem to do with graphics. And the final one really does seem to do with space. So it seems like, you know, maybe it did a decent job. Um, we can't really know in, uh, um, <clears throat> in general. But in this case, because we do have the ground truth labels, we could do a comparison. We actually do know which words you know, are, are, are present in each of these and so on. And actually, more than that, we know, um, well, let's see. So this, this is what we're going to do. So we can compute this um, confusion matrix or normalized confusion matrix, which is going to be the contribution of news group L to cluster K. So this is the true news group. And then our cluster, you can think of as an approximated news group. So here's the matrix. So news group L. I'll, I'll write true versus cluster. And um, let's see. And the columns, looks like the columns are normalized yeah, the columns are normalized to sum to one. So if we focus on every column, we can think of every column as a, as a PMF. So let's look at the first column. That corresponds to the first cluster we found. And you can see that 54.8% of the terms came from alt-atheism. 0.2% came from... 
size space, and 45% came from talk, religion, misc. So it did a very good job of extracting these, but it didn't do a great job of differentiating between those. Now that could be pretty difficult because you can see these are pretty closely related topics. Um, <clears throat> the next cluster, though, didn't really do a very good job, right? It's kind of a mixture of everything. Nothing really stands out among the four of these. But the last two clusters seem to have worked out quite well. Um, so the, this, this one has about 94% are come from Psi Space, and the last one about 90% are coming from Talk Religion Misc. So overall, K-Means did a pretty good job, except in this cluster, it, you know, maybe in that case it didn't do so good of a job. Now let's take a closer look, um, see what, what kind of a clustering error. So let's look at this one. So this one worked out pretty well, but you can see it did make some mistakes. So like, uh, actually, let's see, alt-atheism is the first one. So let's take a look at some of these. Let's look at one example of, of one of these errors here. So it was, it thought that an alt-atheism post belong to a cluster that is dominated by computer graphics. So what happened there? So this is, this is the actual data. And when you look through this, um, you see it talks about color red. Um, Red shows up a few times, color shows up two times. And so maybe it's not so surprising. Those are probably, you know, red and color show up in a lot of the other um, <clears throat> computer graphics posts. So maybe it's not so surprising that the clustering algorithm thought that this was a computer graphics post. So, um, yeah, so that's basically, we learned about k-means, we learned about how to take text documents, turn them into n numbers that we can then apply k-means to, and um, next thing is we'll talk about how we can apply essentially PCA. This is a, another word for PCA in this context, latent semantic analysis, and then we'll, we'll next learn about um, non-negative matrix factorization, which is a, um, it's like PCA with a non-negativity constraint. And so that's going to be very different ways of doing it. And then the very last thing we can talk about would be Gaussian mixture models. And this is a kind of a probabilistic approach to clustering. That's a little bit more similar to k-means, but it comes from a, a probability perspective, um, Gaussian mixtures. So um, I'm wondering, maybe, maybe we should just uh, stop uh, lecture a little bit early today, and then next time we'll, we'll dive into these other methods, um, which are pretty different than what we talked about today. So, so with that, I think I'll, are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly right. It's focusing on how often the terms come up and it's losing the sentence structure. So there definitely are many other applications within um, you know, text processing methods where you really need that sentence structure. So this is really mainly for clustering, for recommender systems, which are, are just trying to you know, things like maybe advertising and things like that. They're just trying to make a recommendation, trying to make an association. If you're talking about, let's say, translating from one language to another, of course, sentence structure is incredibly important to figure out the meaning of the whole sentence. So 
And you could say, well, maybe even an article, maybe to understand the meaning of the article, I can't just look at word counts. I really need to dive in to understand the sentences. And I think that's exactly right. But it's just a lot harder when you go down that path. And, and there, are, there are methods for that. But um, yeah, these are, as you saw, like a lot of recommender systems just sort of stop here. But yeah, it's, it's a great point. OK, um, any other? questions? All right. Well, have a great weekend, everyone. See you guys on Monday.